Good evening and welcome to the Wisdom House, streamed to you directly from our auditorium here at Care for the Family. Your speaker this evening is Rob Parsons. Rob used to be a joint senior partner of a 10 office law firm and they built up one of the biggest consultancies, law consultancies in the, in the UK, requiring Rob to speak to thousands of lawyers, both at home and abroad. But more than 30 years ago, he gave all of that up and he started Care for the Family. He's our founder and our chairman. Rob has written 25 books on families and relationships and communication and, and has spoken to more than a million people at live events all over the world. But just before we uh, join Rob on stage, we'd love to show you a, a little DVD clip of some of the work that we do here at Care for the Family. Watch for a while in any park, playground or street and you'll see many different kinds of families. Some are going through good times but others will be experiencing the heartbreak of life when it doesn't turn out exactly as we'd hoped. The impact when things go wrong can be devastating on the adults but of course especially so on the children. And that's why over a quarter of a century ago, we planted a seed. We had the vision of beginning an organization that would not only help families in the tough times, but help those families put down strong roots in the good times so they could see through those storms if and when they came. And that seed has grown now. Over those years, we've touched the lives of hundreds of thousands of families across the whole of the United Kingdom, bringing encouragement, support, and perhaps most importantly, hope. At Care for the Family, we seek to provide encouragement and support to families through all the different stages and all the various experiences of family life. We help couples in lots of different ways. We produce podcasts, we run marriage events throughout the UK, and we provide marriage preparation resources, helping engaged couples get their relationship off to the best possible start. We help new parents in those first few precious but often challenging weeks after a baby is born, helping the couple build their relationship together so that that new little family unit can remain strong. Our parenting courses run in community centres, in schools, in prisons and in churches. We provide parenting resources online and we help parents have the tools to navigate the ups and downs of parenting from the toddler years right through to the teenage years and beyond. Our activity holidays give the opportunity for fun together and to build special memories that will last a lifetime. Our subsidised take a break holidays for single parents give families who often wouldn't have the opportunity of going on holiday a much needed break. Take a break holiday has been a really positive experience for my daughter and I. To have one week just for you and your child is just amazing. We couldn't just go on holiday like I'd done before. We've done archery, rock climbing, abseiling. We've spent time at the beach, we've had ice creams. It's just been the most fantastic summer holiday. Our amazing network of volunteer befrienders provide encouragement and support to parents of children with additional needs, to those who've been widowed young, and to parents who are grieving after the death of a child. They share from their own experience. They say, this is not just you. At Care for the Family, our passion is to equip families in the good times, to encourage them in the challenging times, to bring hope, and most of all, to make a difference as we strengthen family life in this nation. Sometimes people ask me, did you have any idea how big the seed would grow that you planted all those years ago? And of course, I didn't. But I'm thrilled and humbled as I think how many lives and families we've been able to touch down the years. And of course, a thousand memories come flooding back. I think of a young widow, age 40, who said to me, Rob, if it hadn't been for the care for the family befriender, I honestly don't think I'd have made it. I think of a single parent mum brushing away tears of relief as we'd managed to convince her that what she was going through with her 14-year-old son was normal. And I think of a couple who were about to split up and stayed together 
I know it's not always possible, but in that case, a little boy of nine got his mum and dad back together again. And as I think of all the projects, I realise that we couldn't have done any of them without the faithful support month by month of our partners down the years. And I wonder whether you will help us keep that seed growing to touch families throughout this nation, not just for our children's sake, but for the sake of our children's children. We can do so much more together than apart. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our evening is about to begin. But we have a little surprise for you. We managed to catch up with a very special friend in the library of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. I think you will enjoy this. Hello, I'm David Suchet. Welcome to the Wisdom House. Since the dawn of civilization, mankind has sought wisdom. From the lowliest peasant to the highest monarch. The desire for wisdom knows no social class, financial position, ethnicity, or cultural barriers. Anyone and everyone can seek it out. For many of us, wisdom seems elusive. It's a distant voice or taunting call, a whisper in the darkness. A gentle teacher, a helpful stranger, a steady friend. It appears as experience, as a meditative thought, as a moment of clarity, as a question to be answered. The ancient scribes declared wisdom as she, who above all others must be found. She is holy and unique, subtle, free, pure, clear, loving what is good, benevolent, steadfast, unerring, readily discerned by those who love her and found by those who seek her. For them, she waits at the door and walks with them along the path. Kings and prophets tell us to seek her in our youth, seek her from our palaces, seek her from our plows and barns, seek her from our deathbeds, but to find her, we must listen any fool can talk, but the person of wisdom knows when to listen. Are you listening? Please welcome to the stage, Rob Parsons. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to my study. Uh, let me tell you how all this uh, began. Uh, we have five uh, grandchildren. And when little Jackson the fourth uh, was born, he was born about 11 o'clock on a Saturday evening. And the Sunday morning about 7 o'clock, I'd still not seen this little boy, and I was shaving. And suddenly my phone pinged. And there's a photograph uh, of him. I think, my, he's a handsome little boy. He's got my eyes. At least they would be if they were open, but, but I imagined that they were my eyes. And I suddenly had this incredible desire to write little Jackson a letter. I wanted to share with him some lessons of life I'd learned from people far brighter than I, and a couple I'd learned myself the very hard way. Dear Jackson, welcome to the world. And the second I'd finished penning my letter to Jackson, I just wanted to write to each of my five grandchildren, Share a little wisdom with them. My mother could read and write, but not much more than that. But she was an incredibly wise woman. And she used to tell me a little story when I was a boy of a land far away. And, and as people got older, they would write a life lesson on a scroll. And they'd keep those scrolls, a little hut in the center of the village. And, and once in a while, the village elders would gather people around and read those life lessons to them. They called that place the Wisdom House. And I wanted to create the Wisdom House for my grandchildren. In a moment, I'll show you uh, my favorite photograph of them. And so I wrote uh, the book, uh, The Wisdom House. In my study, I have two big old armchairs. I sit in the one to the right of the fireplace. 
And suddenly in my mind's eye, I imagined them coming in and sitting in that other old chair. You will have to imagine it, they're just over there. Not as the little ones they are now, but as grown men and women. In their 20s or 30s, perhaps even older. And somebody had trod all over their dreams. Somebody had broken their heart. They were tired of trying to be somebody. They just couldn't be anymore just to please somebody else. And we would talk long into the night. And so in my mind's eye tonight, they're going to come in one by one. As I said, not as the little ones they are now, but as grown men and women. And they're going to sit in that chair and we're going to talk together. And you get the chance uh, to listen in. But first of all, let me show you my favorite photograph of them. There they are. Now, there's that number eight, uh, Harry. Uh, uh, that's Katie and Paul's uh, oldest uh, uh, boy. And next to him, little Freddie, <laughs> scrum half. That's uh, Becky and Lloyd's uh, son. And next to him, look, uh, little Jackson. That's Katie and Paul's youngest boy. Little uh, prop forward again. And, and then there's uh, Lily, Lloyd and Becky's oldest girl. And then Evie. Oh, wow, Evie. You better fasten your seatbelts when Evie comes in. But here's Harry. Uh, come on in, Harry. Look at you now. 23 years old. Take a seat, Harry. Harry, I, I understand you've got a, a difficult person in your office that's making life hard for you. I, I'm sorry about that, Harry. Harry, you know we've all got difficult people in our lives. They're in our universities, our, our offices, our schools, our hospitals, sometimes even our, our churches. You know what, Harry? I bet even the good folk here tonight may have a difficult person in their life. Uh, why don't we ask them? Uh, put up your hands if you've got a difficult person in your life. <gasps> Some of you are obviously sat next to your difficult person. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Uh, Harry, let me tell you a couple of things about difficult people. Number one, they are always going to be with us. You know, Harry, years ago I read the history of the railroads. Hundreds of years ago, the railroads began, and, and one bright engineer noticed something incredible. It was the last carriage on a train that was normally involved in accidents. And he suggested they remove it. <laughs> Harry, difficult people in life are like that. You dream of the day they'll go. You imagine that difficult person in the office getting promoted to the Sydney office or, or taking up skydiving and fumbling with a parachute. And, and one day they do get promoted or, and they do fumble with a parachute and suddenly they're gone. Harry, do you know what happens? The second they go, others rise up to take their place. Almost worse than the original ones. So secondly, Harry, if possible, because they'll always be with you, if you can, learn to live with your difficult people. You may be difficult to them. But thirdly, Harry, sometimes you have to find a level with your difficult person. It's not ideal, but it just gets you through. A woman wrote to me some time ago. She said, my sister is my difficult person. We had that big row at the wedding 10 years ago. We've hardly spoken. An occasional phone conversation, a Christmas card, a birthday card. I said, don't cut it off. Keep sending the cards. Make the occasional call. Sometimes you just have to find a level that works for a while to get you through. No need to be a martyr, Harry. Don't want a holiday with your difficult people. But sometimes you just have to find that level. But Harry, sometimes your difficult people are so difficult. They will drain you of energy. They will drain you of joy. And sometimes you really have to limit your exposure to them. Now, Harry, I know the jobs are hard to find. I understand that. But sometimes in extreme circumstances, if you're a difficult person, perhaps as a, a supervisor or a manager, and they're draining the life out of you, sometimes you have to consider moving on. Sometimes they will drain the life out of you. But, Harry, I, I want to suggest another strategy to you. Harry, you generally can't change somebody else, but you can change yourself. And because change is dynamic, when we change, sometimes other people change as well. I think of a young lawyer now, she's 29 years old, and she's a gracious young woman, but boy, did she have a rod of steel down her back. She worked for a London legal practice, 
But unfortunately, she had a managing partner who was very insecure. And the way he sorted out his insecurity was by bringing her down. In fact, he did it with everybody. She said he criticizes my dress, my telephone manner. If I draft a document, he makes sure to find something wrong with it. She said, I wake up every morning with a sick feeling in my stomach. I don't want to go to work. And she said, everybody gossips about him. He's the same with everybody. And, and she said, one morning I woke up and I thought, no. No, I, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I stopped gossiping with the others. And every job he gave me to do, I did it with all my heart. And whenever he did something well, and I could do it sincerely, I praised him for it. Jack, you were great in court today. He'd never had that from his own father, for goodness sake. And week by week, and month by month, and down a couple of years, his attitude to her began to change. In fact, she became just about the only friend he ever had in life. And Harry, I would commend that to you, if you can. But Harry, I want to talk to you for a moment about a certain kind of difficult person, and they are our critics. Now, our critics are always with us, but they are in two categories, and it is desperately important we spot the difference. The first category of critic are on our side, they're on our team. What they say may hurt us, but we need their wisdom. The good book says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Well, when I began speaking in public, a good friend of mine gave me two bits of advice. He said, Rob, if anyone asks you to speak for 30 minutes, speak for 25. It's rude to speak too long. People will say to you at the end, oh, I could have listened to you all day, but they won't mean it. <laughs> Secondly, he said, stop saying that silly thing you're saying at the end of your talks. I said, what silly thing? He said, you keep saying, oh, I wish we had more time to go into this in more detail. He said, don't do that for two reasons. Number one, the audience feel cheated. They wonder what they've missed. Secondly, if the chairman said, well, actually, Rob, we do have another hour, <gasps> you will have a clue what to talk about. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But Harry, listen hard. The second kind are not on your side. They do not criticize to build you up, but to bring you down. They will criticize everything about you, the way you dress your hair, the car you drive. If you've got kids, your kids. They will do, uh, criticize every aspect of your life. And Harry, you will try to please them, but you will never please them. Write that down, Harry. You will never, ever please them. Now, Harry, in a quiet moment, put the coffee on and listen to what they say. There may be a grain of truth in it, but don't spend your life looking over your shoulder, trying to change your life just to make them happy. In fact, if you change something, they'll move on to something else. Where's the first critic? Well, like a builder, gradually building something beautiful brick by brick. This kind of like a demolition expert. They come along with a big steel ball to knock down what somebody else has created. You will never, ever Please them. I once saw a letter from a woman 70 years old. She wrote tragic words. I have spent 50 years, she said, half a century in the prison of other people's opinions of my life. Don't do time in that prison, Harry. It will stop you finding out who you really are. You know, Bronnie Ware was a palliative nurse. She nursed people in the final moments of their lives. She wrote an incredible book called The Five Regrets of the dying. And she noticed as people came to the end of their lives, they expressed the same regrets. And number one, Harry, was this. I wish I'd lived a life more true to myself. I wish I hadn't always tried to meet other people's expectations uh, of me. You know, the saddest letter I ever got in the charity with which I've worked for 30 years, Harry, was from a woman. I know it word for word. Rob, thanks for coming to our, our city with your seminar. I really enjoyed it. I was a disappointment to my father. He wanted a son. He never told me he loved me. He never hugged me. He never praised me. I think he thought praise might make me big-headed. I know he was a product of his generation. But my self-esteem is very low now. I am often depressed. I'm riddled with guilt. And then, Harry, she wrote these words. I am 85 years old. I've tried to imagine her as a little girl of 10, running home with a painting for her father, dressing as a teenager to please him, but she could never please him. He wanted her to be somebody she just couldn't be. Do you know what she wanted to be an actress? He wanted her to be a chartered accountant. Nothing wrong with that. Except she was meant to dance her way through life on stages, and she spent 40 years crunching numbers. And he's long since dead. 
But even now, he's like a ghost at her shoulder when she's 85 years old, still demanding she become somebody she just can't be. I, I, I've got a little confession, Harry. I'm embarrassed to tell you, and I'm even more embarrassed to tell the people in the auditorium, but uh, Harry, I like karaoke. Uh, if I, you invite me to your wedding, you've got a karaoke machine. I'll pretend I don't want to play, but you get me on that thing, you'll never get me off. And, and as I'm on there, I know who I'll pretend to be. I'll pretend to be Elvis, the king himself. And you know the funny thing about karaoke, Harry? You can get the suit and the backing track, and you can actually believe for a moment you're the king. And you're belting out suspicious minds. And, and Harry, karaoke is fine. Unless one day you wake up one morning and you whisper under your breath, I want to sing my own song today. But Harry, they won't let you. The audience are baying out for you to climb into the old costume and put on the old backing tapes, and they will not let you be you. Harry, your great-grandmother cleaned other people's homes for a living. We had a poor home. We didn't have much money. And she took me aside one day when I was about 13, 14 years old, and she said to me, son, I know you have to mix with kids who have more money than us, but I want you to know this. You are not better than anybody else, but you are as good as anybody else. Treat all with respect, but you're as good as anybody else. And Rob, I want you to know I believe in you. There's nothing to prove. And later in life, you may discover that you are special to God. And when that happens, everything will change. Wow, Harry, what a thing to send a kid into life with. I am loved. I am accepted. There is nothing to prove. And Harry, when you discover that, it will help you decide more easily what your strengths are. I believe what God has given each of us, talents, strengths, and we need to find them. I want to talk to you about that for a little bit, but... But first of all, Harry, I'd, I'd like you to watch this, uh, this little film. So I'm, I'm getting on a bit now. I've, I've had a good life on the whole, but it, it was spoiled by one thing. Um, I tried too hard to please other people. You know, I was always trying to be the kind of person that they wanted me to be. Like my husband, he was always saying he wished I were more like his friend's wife and, and she was very stylish and, and attractive. So I did try hard to be like her you know, to dress and, and look the way she did. And then she left her husband for a man doing door-to-door -door sales and my mind went quiet for a while after that. Sometimes I try to be different because I thought being myself wasn't enough, you know, even, even when it came to being mum to my kids. Uh, but have you any idea how very tiring it is to live like that? And, and I'm not really sure why, but when I was about 70, I, I suddenly realised what I'd been doing and, and why I wasn't happy. I woke up one morning, ready to make yet another batch of cakes, and I said to myself, Carol, you've never enjoyed making cakes. You only do it because the children and grandkids expect you to, and the over 60s like you to make something for coffee morning. So then I realised that what I'd much rather be doing is something that I love, something like visiting people stuck at home. You know, everyone says how friendly I am, and they also say how much they enjoy my company. So I decided to put away my horrible cake tins, and concentrate on visiting and and just be me and I've liked being me ever since isn't that an incredible line I've liked being me ever since you know Harry Wayne Gretzky may be the greatest ice hockey player who ever lived and one day somebody said to him hey Gretzky how come you're so good this is how he replied I skate where the puck is going to be I skate where the puck is going to be. Somebody asked the sports psychologist, could we train that into young athletes? She couldn't stop laughing for a month. This is Gretzky's innate strength, his talent. You know, Harry, when I was a little boy, my mom and dad didn't go to church. But they, little on the corner of my seat. You know, Harry, when I was a little boy, my mom and dad didn't go to church. But on the corner of my street was a little chapel. And one day, Miss Williams from that chapel knocked on every door in our little terrace of houses, and she asked every adult that opened that door the same question. Would any boys or girls in this house like to come to Sunday school? And my mother said, he'd like to go. 
And Miss Williams took me by the hand and she led me down the road and into the world of Sunday school. What a woman she was. She never did have any kids. She was never married. And yet Miss Williams had hundreds of children. And we love Miss Williams for many things. We loved her for the little stamp she gave us if we turned up to Sunday school. We loved her for her teas on a Sunday. But most of all, we loved her for her stories. Miss Williams was an incredible raconteur. She told us the story of the boy who brought their lunch to, J to Jesus, of the man that could walk on water. But our favorite was David and Goliath. Because we all had a bully in school we'd like to see decapitated. <laughs> but Harry, one till I was in my 50s, I discovered something about that story that changed my life. See, basically uh, what happens, Harry, is the young shepherd boy goes to the king of Israel and says, Oh, king, it seems your soldier's afraid of the giant Goliath, but I'd like to have a crack at him. And the king says, Well, you can on one condition. I am King Saul, and you must wear Saul's armor. Now, now, David doesn't want to offend the king, so he climbs into this thing. The second he does, he knows he's made a dreadful mistake. He can hardly move in this stuff. And Harry, I don't know what happened, of course, but something like this must have gone on. He must have said, oh, king, I don't want to offend you. You're the king of Israel, for goodness sake, but I can't wear your armor because I'm not you. If you will set me free with a sling and a couple of stones, you will see things you can only dream of. Harry, the whole world wants to put us in Saul's armor. Sometimes parents do it to us. Sometimes teachers, sometimes employers. They want us to be just like them. But Harry, you must have the confidence to be you. To have the strength to move in the incredible gifts and talents God has given you. Well, Harry, I'll see you uh, a bit later. As you know, I've got your cousin Lily coming in a moment, and she's got a very big day on tomorrow, so, uh, so I'll see you uh, a bit later on. Oh, my Lily. 24 years old. Look at you. Come and give Pops a kiss. Ladies and gentlemen, if any of you may become grandparents, let me warn you. Be careful what they call you the second they can speak because you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. Come and give Pops a kiss. Take a seat, Lily. Oh, darling, big day tomorrow. Your mum showed me your dress. Oh, darling, you're going to look lovely. And can I suggest you take a good look at your groom tomorrow because, frankly, Lily, he's going to look about as good tomorrow as he's ever going to look in life. <laughs> you love him very much, don't you? I know you do. Darling, I, I, I wondered whether I can talk to you about what I want to talk to you about. But, but, you know, we've had lots of talks in this old study, haven't we? You sat in that chair when you were 15 and you, you failed that first exam and you cried and I made you cocoa. And then when you were 16 and your first real boyfriend finished with you and your heart was broken and, and I told you there are plenty more fish in the sea. And you told me that as people get very old, they say the silliest things. <laughs> Darling, I, I don't expect you to believe or even understand what I'm about to say to you now. But I want to talk to you for a moment about the nature of love. You know, darling, for many years I worked with a big family charity and, and occasionally I'd be interviewed on, on television or sometimes radio and often people would say, well, Mr. Parsons, what is the greatest threat to family life? I always gave the same answer. It is the very modern belief that love is just a feeling. And when the feeling goes, we can just walk away. Now, darling, I've worked in this big family charity for a long time. I, I saw enough pain in a week to last me a lifetime. I know it's not possible or even desirable to keep every relationship together. Nevertheless, darling, if we are not prepared to at least try to go on loving for a while, when the feeling of love is gone, you and I will not find love that lasts a lifetime with anybody. You are very much in love now, and I know that. But darling, the day may come for you, perhaps for both of you. And one day you will wake up and you will not feel 
as in love as you do today. And then, my darling, you will have to make a big decision. You will have to decide that because the feeling of love has gone down now, that you will just walk away. And people will say, well, I understand that. Or whether you at least try, unless you will fight to keep love alive. Whether you will see whether you can love at least for a while, not just because of, as you will tomorrow, but in spite of. Whether you at least try to love, not just with a heart, but with the will. Lily, I understand tomorrow that the, the preacher's going to read that passage, that lovely passage from the New Testament, that lovely poem of love from 1 Corinthians 13. Listen hard, darling. You will hear nothing about feelings. This is a love that does things. Love is not arrogant. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. This is a love that at least can try to love not just with a heart, but with the will. I, I go to write my books in a little cottage overlooking Carmarthen Bay in West Wales. And, and a couple of years ago, it was a lovely August day. I was walking on, on the beach, and it was just wonderful. The sea looked as though somebody had taken a million diamonds and scattered them across its surface. The hills were beautiful. The sand was incredible. And as I made my way back up to the cottage, there was an old fisherman there. And I said, it's idyllic, isn't it? I don't know if he was always grumpy or just tired of Taurus that day, but he barked back at me. You should see it in January. And you know, darling, when I walked on the beach the next day, it was equally lovely. But it was as if I felt the sea and the hills and the sand whisper to me, would you love us in January? Darling, January love comes to every relationship. This is not the heat of summer. This is the cold of winter, whether we see whether that love can at least burst through the frost and grow again. You know, darling, I remember years ago in the charity that I worked in, a, a young couple came to talk to me one day in my office. She was cradling a little girl of six months old, their first child. And I said to this young man, why are you leaving your wife and your little girl? He said, I don't feel in love anymore. When we got married, I was so in love, but I don't feel like that now. I said, did nobody ever tell you that the feelings of love go up and down? Did nobody tell you that sometimes after the birth of a little one, it's a bit hard going? The relationship may be strained. Perhaps the sex is not so good for a while. Did nobody tell you sometimes you have to love not just with the heart, but with the will? Did nobody ever tell you about, about January love? And he said, no, nobody. Nobody told me that. And I look at this little girl. She's six months old. And the first man in her life is about to walk out on her. And nobody told him that. Nobody sums this up for me like Richard Seltzer. Seltzer was a surgeon. He wrote a book called Mortal Lessons in the Art of Surgery. I know pretty well word for word what he wrote in one of the chapters. He said, I stand by a bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. To remove a tumor in her cheek, I have cut a little nerve. I promise you with religious fervor, I have followed the curve of her flesh. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor, I have cut the nerve. Her mouth is twisted. It will be thus from now on. I watch her and her husband dwell in the evening lamplight of the ward. I ask myself, who are this couple who touch each other so generously, so greedily? The young woman looks up. She says, will my mouth always be like this? I say, yes, I am sorry. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. He says, I like it. It's kind of cute. And he bends to kiss her crooked mouth and eyes so close. I can see his altar in the shape of his lips to prove their kiss will still work. And I remember that in ancient times, the gods appeared as men. And I hold my breath and let the wonder in. Lily, that young man wasn't a god. But he was saying something like this to himself. When I married you, you looked like that. And I know you would like to look like that now, but I will love you. And darling, there'll come a time in all our relationships where those we love become unattractive, at least for a while, emotionally, physically, intellectually. And at that time, if we can, we are called to change the shape of our lips to see if the kiss will still work. To love not just with the heart, but with the will. One of the most uh, loved and famous books in English literature is Captain Curley's uh, Mandolin. His daughter is in love with the dashing army captain.
captain. And her old father, Dr. Inanis, gives his daughter a little advice with regard to love. And I want to read that to you now, the day before you wedded. Now listen, it's a bit saucy near the end, but I'm an old man and you're a woman now, so we'll get through it. Uh, <laughs> when you fall in love, it is a temporary madness. It erupts like an earthquake and then it subsides. And when it subsides, you have to make a decision. You have to work out whether your roots are to become so entwined together, it is inconceivable that you should ever part. Because this is what love is. Love is not breathlessness, it is not excitement, it is not lying awake imagining he is kissing every part of your body. For that is just being in love, which any of us can convince ourselves we are. Love itself is what is left over when being in love has burned away. It'll be a wonderful day, darling. If you let me make a speech, I'll do okay. I used to do lots of that stuff. Oh, I'll lose my glasses and my place, but, but I'll do okay for you. Now give uh, Pops another kiss, and, and I'll see you tomorrow. <coughs> By wisdom, a house is built. Make that right. <coughs> Darling, it's going to be a wonderful day uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, if you let me make a speech, I I'll do okay. I used to do lots of that kind of stuff years ago. I I'll lose my glasses and my place, and I will cry, but, but I'll do okay for you. Darling, I'll, I'll see you uh, tomorrow. In a moment, I want to introduce Jackson to you. But first of all, uh, let's listen to David uh, Suchet again. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding it is established. So says the proverb. Unlike the flash of power, the glint of wealth, or the sparkle of fame, wisdom works quietly, rarely drawing attention to itself. So many voices clamor for our allegiance. But wisdom often stands silently by, occasionally whispering to us that here, in wisdom, will we find a deeper and more satisfying life. What do we gain from wisdom? Does it make life easier? Can we avoid rush hour traffic or unclog the kitchen sink with wisdom? Does it clear up acne or provide whiter teeth? Will it get us that Christmas bonus at work? Can it guarantee any success in life? Are we safer at home, more secure, more stable? Will we get better grades at school? Can wisdom give us ripped muscles or eye-catching features? Will wisdom ensure that we'll never suffer heartbreak? What is the benefit of wisdom? Our questions betray that we've set our sights too low to what is functional and expedient. Wisdom shows us a higher, greater, lasting and transcendent reality. An ancient king admonishes us to pray not for scepters and thrones, nor for priceless gems, nor gold, nor silver, nor health, nor beauty, but for she who surpasses them all. Wisdom. Well, 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 Jackson. 22 years old, prop forward. Jackson, come on in, take a seat. Jackson, I want to talk to you about dreams. You know, psychologists say uh, that most people have three basic dreams. Now, the good folk in the auditorium won't admit to one of them, but I'll bet they have this dream. The first one is that you... You think you're falling off a cliff. Apparently, if you hit the floor, you die, Jackson, but, uh, but nobody's been able to verify that. Uh, secondly, uh, it's uh, May the 1st. You've got an exam on June the 1st, and you haven't done any work at all. I'll be honest, Jackson, for me, that's not so much of a dream as, uh, as a memory. <laughs> and the third one, and this is the one they won't admit to, Jackson, you're naked in public. 
It's the Queen's garden party. She's coming towards you carrying a, a tray of cucumber sandwiches and you haven't got a stitch of clothing on. But that's not the kind of dream I want to talk to you about, Jackson. I want to talk to you about a different kind of dream. But first of all, I'd, I'd like you to watch this, this little film. I'd just come first in a painting competition in our whole area. And the judges, one of them was a professional artist, all said I had amazing potential. I remember running home and telling my mum that I wanted to be an artist. Neither my mum or my dad were particularly artistic, although my nan was a brilliant painter. And I don't think my mum was being unkind, but she hardly looked at me painting. She said, that's a nice picture, love, but make sure you get good grades in the real subjects. So you've got lots of choices when you're done. Well, when she said that, I went up to my bedroom and scrunched up my painting and threw it in the bin. I'm a bank manager now. I think I'm pretty good at my job. Sometimes, sometimes I sit in my office and gaze up at the paintings on the wall that head office has chosen and wonder what I might have produced if I were an artist. Sometimes I see amazing pictures in my mind and get an urge to get out some paints or paper. Something always stops me, I guess. Perhaps one day I will, but I don't think so. Not now. Jackson, I want you to know you've got a right to your dreams. You'll have a right to... <clears throat> Jackson, I want you to know you've got a right to your dreams. You don't have a right to them being fulfilled, and you certainly don't have a right to walk all over everybody else just to see them fulfilled, but you've got a right to your dreams. You know, Jackson, when I was a teenager, I had some dreams, but, you know, we weren't an academic house. I really didn't understand uh, uh, school. Not, not at all. We only had three books in our home, Jackson. We had an atlas, and we had a Bible, although my parents didn't, didn't go to church. And we had something called the doctor's book. It was a scary book to consult if you were ill, because almost every illness you looked up, you had. And also the one on the facing, on the facing uh, page. I don't even think I was lazy. I, I somehow managed to pass for the grammar school, but it was like landing on Mars to me. In fact, when I was 14, my school report records the fact that there were 34 kids in my class. I had come... 34th. My form teacher, W.P. Lewis, B.A., as he signed that report, wrote all over my report card a disgraceful result. He is making no use of what little ability he has. I don't argue with that, Jackson. I remember when I was about 15, we had a chance to go look at an architect's office as part of a careers program. And as I'm leaving, a teacher says, where are you going, Parsons? I said, sir, I'm going to look at an architect's office. I may be designing buildings one day. He couldn't stop laughing for an hour. You know, Jackson, sometimes even those who love you will pour cold water on your dreams. I remember when I was 21 going home to tell my dad some incredible news. He was just about to go on night shift as a postman. He was shaving. I said, Dad, I've just met this guy. He's a lawyer. And he says, I could be a lawyer. I could be a solicitor. He's going to pay for me to go through law school. Jackson, I can remember what my father said as though he was standing next to me now. He said, son, people like us don't become lawyers. I don't think he was trying to hurt me, Jackson. He was probably trying to keep me from the pain of failure. But even so, he was pouring cold water on my dreams. People will do that to you sometimes. Sometimes friends will do it. Husbands, wives will do it. Sometimes employers will do it. But Jackson, if you're going to see your dreams fulfilled, you're going to have to have a couple of things in place. Number one, you're probably going to need to find a dream catcher. And you know, Jackson, there'll be people in the auditorium tonight, and they actually haven't got a dream of their own, but they could be a dream catcher for somebody else. I met mine when I was about uh, 15 years old. I'm about to drop out of church. I'd begun to go to church, but I don't really understand church. And I'm certainly going to drop out of school, and all I want to do is be a rock and roll singer. And I'm walking down the road, and an older man from that little church on the corner of our street comes up to me, Arthur Tovey. Arthur and his wife were poor. 
They lived in two rooms in his mother's house. Arthur and his wife were told at that time they could not have children of their own. Arthur had never passed an academic examination. Arthur had a bad speech impediment. But Arthur and Margaret loved kids. And he said, Rob, next Wednesday in our home, we're having a little Bible study for teenagers. Would you like to come? Jackson, when all you want to do is walk onto the stage in Las Vegas dressed in gold lame, a Bible study on a Wednesday night, it's not the greatest offer you've ever had. But for some reason, I heard myself say, yes. He was a brilliant psychologist. He taught us bits of the Bible for 25 minutes, and then they got two bits of hardwood and put them on top of the dining table, and we played ping pong for half an hour. And then with what little money they had, they saved enough to buy us fish and chips. And as we're coming back from the chip shop and the vinegar is seeping through the paper, Margaret would have the tea brewing. When you walked into Arthur and Margaret's home, you felt like a king. No matter what anybody else said about you, Arthur told you you were special. Margaret told you that God had given you gifts. If you missed that class, he'd come hunting you down. And when I was about 16, he said, Robert, do you ever take part in debates in school? I said, Arthur, I don't even put my hand up in class. He said, well, I think God has given you a gift of public speaking. And I'm going to teach you. Jackson, that was scary. Arthur was the worst public speaker you've ever heard in your life. But he did teach me. First of all, speaking to children, and then a little later to a couple of adults. And Jackson, even I'm not sure how it happened, but by the time I was in my early 30s, I was a joint senior partner of a 10 office legal practice. And And one day, the Law Society of England and Wales rang me up and asked me to be a keynote speaker in front of a 1,000 lawyers at their national conference in Vienna. And as I'm about to walk on stage, I decide I'll try and ring Arthur. He lived in a little prefabricated house then in the north of Cardiff. And I rang him on my mobile phone. In those days, Jackson was the size of a small semi-detached house. (laughs) And I rang him. I said, Arthur, it's me. I'm about to go on stage. There's 1,000 lawyers out there. You taught me to do this. He said, did I? A couple of years after that, I was promoting one of my books in Colorado Springs in the USA, and I'm in a radio studio being interviewed, and they get Arthur online as a surprise to me. And at the end of the interview, the radio host said to him, well, what do you think of the boy who came to your Bible class? He said, I am proud of him. I cried on air. Arthur Margaret had nothing. But they must have sat down one day and said, well, darling, we don't seem to have very much. But we got two rooms. I think if we put some hardboard on top of that table, we could play ping pong with them if they got a little bored. I think I could teach them a little, uh, a little bit of the Bible. If we saved our money, we could buy fish and chips. And why don't we give it a shot? Arthur changed my life. He died a couple of years ago. Uh, and just before he died, I went to see him in hospital. He was practically comatose, but I think he heard me. I put my lips next to his ear, and I said, Arthur, thank you. He changed my life. And I kissed him. Dream catchers can do that. Dream catchers can achieve in others what they could never achieve in themselves. And I wonder if some of you might be a dream catcher for somebody else. Perhaps one of those kids hanging around on the corner of your street. One of the kids on the edge of church about to leave. Somebody in your school. What if you could be a dream catcher? And then, Jackson, if you're going to see your dream fulfilled, you've got to be prepared to fail. Roosevelt put it like this. The credit doesn't belong to the man or woman who points out where the strong man or woman could have done better. No, no. The credit belongs to the man or woman who's in the arena, whose face is marred by sweat and blood and tears, who even if they fail, at least fail daring greatly. Failure's not the major problem, Jackson. Jackson, look at this study. It's full of books and full of poetry. I love poetry. And my favorite poem, only given to me by my daughter uh, about two years ago, is I think the shortest poem I've ever come across. Would you like to hear it, Jackson? It has to do with having a crack at something, even if you fail. Would you like to hear it? Would you like to hear it? Okay, here we go. There is freedom waiting for you on the breezes of the sky. And you say, but what if I fall? Oh, my darling, what if you fly? There is freedom waiting for you on the breezes of the sky. And you say, but what if I fall? Oh, my darling, 
What if you fly? And then, Jackson, you've got to begin. In the middle of the Old Testament is a quirky little book called Ecclesiastes. And in it is this remarkable verse. Those who watch the wind never sow, and those who watch the clouds never reap. In other words, the time is never exactly right to start anything. You know what? If I put the seed in the ground now, it's sure to get windy and blow away. And, and, and if we try the harvest now, it's sure to start raining. You know what, Jackson? Sometimes you have to just stick that seed in the ground and give it a shot. You have to begin. A friend of mine is a politician, and 12 years ago, he was very overweight. He could hardly walk around the block, honestly. And he was asked to speak to 12 young people who had just been excluded from school. Some of them come out of young offenders institutions. And he turns up and he looks at them and says, you don't want to listen to me for an hour, do you? And they say, no, sir, we don't. He said, I'll do a deal with you. Line up 12 chairs, and I'll ask you one question down the row that way, and one question that way, and when I finish, we're done, you can go. Is that a deal? They were prepared to sign the deal in blood. Okay, he said, here we go then. What are your dreams? I want to be a hairdresser. I want to work in films or cameras in some way. I want to work with children. Okay, so now we've got 12 dreams. Now we start the next question. What one thing have you done today to move you a little closer to your dream? Nothing, 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 nothing. Sir, sir, my father's in prison. My brother's in prison. My, never mind that. What one thing? Nothing. Okay, so now we've got 12 dreams and 12 nothings. Now you've kept your side of the bargain. I'll keep mine. You can go. Except now... I have an hour spare. I'm going downstairs to the canteen to have lunch. If any of you want to join me, I'll do two things. I'll buy you lunch, and I'll see if I can get you started on your dream. Eight of them came with him. And what happened in a couple of those kids' lives in the next couple of years was incredible. But at the end of lunch, somebody said to him, Sir, what's your dream? And remember, this guy can hardly walk, and I mean it. He said, Sir, what's your dream? He said, you don't, you, don't, you don't want to know my dream. Sir, tell us your dream. I want to walk around the world. The kid says, what one thing have you done today? He said, listen, I'm a politician. Never mind all that. What one thing have you done today? My friend heard himself say, when I came in, I saw a poster advertising a walk from Holy Island down to Durham to raise money for your charity. I'll see if I can do it. And my friend began, instead of taking public transport, to walk back and forth to the House of Parliament every day, every day, Every day. My friend has walked almost 10,000 miles. My friend has raised almost a million pounds for charity. My friend is walking his dream. And Jackson, do you know how it began? It began one day against all the odds when my friend did this. That's how you begin a dream, Jackson. You've got to begin. Helen Keller was very ill when she was a child. Blind, mute, she she learned to speak by holding her fingers against her tutor's larynx. But you know what? She grew up, she graduated from Cambridge College, Massachusetts. She formed the Helen Keller Home for Blind Children. She lectured all over the world. And one day, she was getting off a plane in Los Angeles. A journalist stuck a microphone in her face and said, Miss Keller, can you imagine anything worse than being blind? Oh, yes, she said. To be able to see and have no vision. Jackson, the good book says, without a vision, the people perish. We are born for dreams. Isaac Perlman may well be the greatest violinist the world has ever seen. But Perlman had polio. He has a caliper on his left leg. And here's the deal when Perlman plays at your concert. The orchestra in place, the conductor in place, the audience in place. And Perlman shuffles on stage to take a seat to play solo violin. Straightens his leg, takes the caliper off. But on this night, they've come to hear Perlman. Because it's a very difficult violin solo, six minutes at the end of the piece. They've come to hear Perlman. Jackson, 30 seconds into that violin solo, one of Pillman's four strings breaks. It sounds like a bullet ricocheting around the auditorium. The audience gasps, the conductor drops his baton, uh, and then Pillman waves him to carry on, and for the next five and a half minutes, brilliantly transposing the music from four strings to three, he finishes the piece. When he finished, his shoulders sagged, there was sweat pouring off his brow, and in the auditorium for about 10 seconds, Total silence. And then people went crazy. They were standing on the seats. They were applauding. The audience were were going crazy. The orchestra were banging their instruments together. They were applauding this genius, this gift of joy he'd given them. And then Perlman asked for silence in a microphone. 
But when they gave it to him, he shouted twice into the darkness of the auditorium, All my life, it has been my mission to make music from what remains. All my life, it has been my mission to make music from what remains. Jackson, you are young and I am old. But neither of us can do anything about yesterday. But by God's grace in our lives and in the lives of others, as we find our own dreams and as we help them find their dreams, you and I can make music from what remains. Jackson, I'll, I'll see you a little later. I, I got Freddie coming in a, in a moment. But before he does, let's, let's listen to David Suchet again. Listen close, you kings of the earth and magistrates of the land. Listen to my words, sellers in the marketplaces and workers in the fields. You, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, lift up your heads from your hearths and books, from your toil and leisure. Listen. For wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the open squares, she raises her voice. Down the crowded pathways, she calls out. At the city gates, she proclaims her words. Turn your ear to wisdom and incline your heart to understanding. As the fool desires silver and gold, you should desire wisdom. Only then will you understand true counsel. Only then will you become a shield to guard the paths of justice. Only then will you avoid the ways of darkness and evil. Peace and security await those who hear and obey her words. Make these words of wisdom the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, wear them on your neck and shoulder, and write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you shall walk on the straight paths without fear of obstacles or stumbling. Wisdom will be your light, growing in brilliance to that perfect day when you will see God in his eternal kingdom. Hey, Freddy, come on in. Little scrum half, not so little now. 21 years old. Take, take a seat, Freddie. I, I want to talk to you about friendship. You know, when I was a little boy in, in primary school, about, uh, about 10 years old, there was a boy in our class called Roger Lewis. Roger had it all. Roger was bright. He came top in all the exams. Roger was fast. He won all the races, and Roger was handsome. It was Roger the girls wanted to kiss behind the bike sheds, do you know what, Freddie? It was as if heaven had found a big box full of gifts and talents and used them all up on Roger. And somebody said, hang on a minute, they were meant to be shared out between the whole class. Too late. Roger had got uh, the lot. And Roger had lots of friends. And, and one weekend, I, I decided I was going to ask Roger a question. I, I practiced it all weekend in front of the mirror and twice in front of my mother. As I was walking to school on that Monday morning, I was practicing this question under my breath, and, and I got into the playground, and there was Roger surrounded by all his courtiers, and I, I almost bottled, but I took a deep breath, and I pushed my way through, and suddenly I'm face to face with Roger Lewis. And I say the question I practiced all weekend, Roger, Roger, would you like to be my best friend? I had thought of offering... Roger, a reciprocal arrangement where we would be each other's best friends, but he may not go for that. What did he have to lose by this? Would, would you like to be my best friend? He didn't hear me at first, and he asked me to repeat it, so I did. And then people started to laugh. Freddie in school, I had a nickname, and pretty soon that nickname was echoing all over the playground. Parsnips, parsnips, parsnips. Who'd want parsnips as a best friend? Well, thankfully, Freddie, a little later in life, a couple of people did. But, but you know the funny thing about friendship, Freddie, is, is when you're little, you tend to have lots of friends. But as we get older, it's as if friendship falls off a cliff. But friends are important. Research done by Duke Medical Center discovered that having two or three close 
friends. You don't need a Christmas card list of a thousand. Two or three close friends affected your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, even your longevity. Friendships are important, Freddie. But there's a quality that you need to build strong friendships that's very hard today, and it's vulnerability. We're all so keen to tell each other how great we are and how great we're doing. And you know what, Freddie, if ever you get married and have kids, people will start sending you their Christmas family newsletters. <gasps> Freddie, don't open those envelopes. Those are dangerous things. They'll tell you their kids have like a... 10,000 GCSEs. There'll be enough stars to light the planetarium. They'll send you pictures of their skiing holiday. They've just knocked the garage down to get their big car in. And We don't like vulnerability much, Freddie. First question, men particularly ask other men at parties, is what do you do? Do you know, Freddie, a couple of years ago, I, I was at a party. Uh, we were in the garden. There were 12 of us men in a circle around a barbecue. man on my left was unemployed. And ten minutes late, a man burst into the, the circle. These were his exact words, Freddie. Hi, guys. My name is, is Simon. I want you to tell me your names and what each of you do. My heart went out to the man who was unemployed. Now, I'm a lawyer. I'm not ashamed of that, Freddie. But, but, but I decided to, to not play that game. And I said, well, I'm a sales representative for doll's eyes. He said, you what? Uh, I said, I'm a sales representative for doll's eyes, and business is not very good at the moment. I don't want to talk about it. The man on my right was an eminent pathologist, professor of pathology. He said, I'm a butcher. The other men caught the game, and, and Freddie, by the time we got to the man who was unemployed, he was a brain surgeon. <laughs> and later on in the evening, the guy who had asked the question sat next to me. He'd had a little too much wine by then, and he said, are you really? It mattered to him. But, Freddie, it shouldn't uh, matter. Vulnerability is important. In fact, Freddie, I'd like you to write this down. I would ask the folks in the auditorium to write it down, but they're much too sophisticated. But you write it down, Freddie. If you want acquaintances, tell them your successes. But if you want friends, tell them your fears. If you want acquaintances, tell them your successes. But if you want friends, tell them your fears. Uh, and Fred, you have to work out this in the everyday of life. You might be in the student union and somebody will say, you know, I'm not coping with this course. It's okay to say, you know, last year I struggled. I, I had to move courses. You might be in the office and someone will say, we, we're having some trouble with our 15-year-old. It's okay to say, you know, a couple of years ago we had a bit of problem with, with our uh, youngest one. You might say in the factory, you know, I'm not sleeping. I'm worried about the redundancies. Uh, me too. You can't wear your heart on your sleeve with everybody, Freddie. But don't be afraid to be vulnerable. When we open our hearts, people are drawn uh, to us. You know, when you were a little boy, you used to sit on my lap in that chair, and I used to read this little story to you, The Velveteen Rabbit. And I want to read a little bit of it to you again now. What is real? asked the rabbit one day, when they were laying side by side uh, near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you want a stick-out handle? No, real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt, asked the rabbit. Well, sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. But when you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Uh, does it happen all at once, like being wound up or bit by bit? No, it doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. And that's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or who have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can never be ugly again except to people who don't really understand. But, Freddie, if vulnerability is a key to friendship, there is another characteristic that makes friendship almost impossible, at least close friendship. It is control. It's hard to have a good friendship with someone who's controlling. You know, if you're in trouble, they'll travel a thousand miles to help you, but they will not let you help them. Control kills friendship, and vulnerability 
makes it blossom. Just one more thing on friendship, uh, Freddie. A couple of years ago, I got off a plane in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I turned my mobile phone on. There was a text message, ring home urgently. My friend Bob had died. I didn't even know Bob was, was ill. Bob was a builder. <laughs> uh, he understood the joke in that as well. And, uh, and forgive me if you're a builder here tonight, but, but Bob was a typical builder. You'd ask him to, to price a job, and he'd come in, and he'd look around, he'd suck his cheeks in, and he'd go, who did this work for you? It's terrible. And I'd say, you did, Bob. And he'd say, oh, well, it was, it was a long time ago. I remember huddling down in baggage reclaim in Johannesburg Airport and crying like a baby. I have, for several days, I rang his mobile phone. I, I wanted to hear Bob's voice again. Bob was my friend. You know, about once a month, four of us guys got together. We used to play snooker together once a month. And, and on the wall was a chalkboard which enumerated the highest score we'd ever got in 10 years. Now, the highest score you can get in snooker is 147. And the highest we'd ever got was 35. And when I got back from South Africa, I saw that Bob had sneaked into the room at the end of the last game and he'd written, Bob, one, four, six. I don't know whether his maths was bad or he couldn't even cheat properly, but we have decided it will never, ever, if possible, be erased. It is still there today. Bob was my friend. Did we hurt each other? Yes. Did we argue? Yes. Did we ever row? Yes. Did we ever fall out? Yes, occasionally. But you know what we made up? Sometimes like a grumpy old couple, we made up and forgave each other. And you know what? Once in a while, we told each other that we mattered to each other. Don't be sniffy about emotion with your, your friends, Freddie. I was talking to 500 men the other day, and I said, guys, what I've said to you, Freddie, don't be sniffy about emotion. Tell your mates that you care for them. The sky's not going to fall in if once in a while you say to a friend, I love you. Take Time for friendship, ready. Make that phone call. Drink that coffee. Friends matter. Ready, I'll see you a bit later. I've got to get these people ready for Evie. And as you know, that is not an easy task. So, so I'll see you a bit, uh, a bit later. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce you to Evie in a moment. You know, if you have more than one child, you'll almost certainly have chalk and cheese. That is particularly galling if the first one is compliant, because that's what lures you into having the second one. Our first, Katie was so compliant, but Lloyd was our testing one. Oh, do you know, when that boy was four years old, he urinated in a milk bottle in the kitchen. That wouldn't have been a big problem if, if there hadn't been milk in, in, in the milk bottle. And even that wouldn't have been a big deal, I suppose, if my wife Diane hadn't been having friends around for coffee that afternoon. And I suppose even that wouldn't have been a major issue if Lloyd had told his mother what he'd done before they had coffee. <laughs> but even now, Diane says she has two images seared in her mind. The first is of a friend, Sheila, saying, Dan, I, I think this milk may be slightly off. But secondly, is if this little boy holding his sides, watching them giggling uncontrollably. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know why that boy was laughing? He wasn't laughing because he'd piddled in a milk bottle. He was laughing because he was saying to himself, you think this is a big deal, Mum? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm four. You want to see me when I'm 14? And so it happened. And the testing toddler turned into the testing teenager. In fact, when he was a teenager, I can remember he's about 15. I'm beside myself. I decide to reread, and I've written 25 books on this stuff, everything I've ever written on parenting. And to be honest, none of it helped the jot, <laughs> which I quite understand is not a great incentive for you to buy the books. But I'm beside myself, and I do a deal with God. I know you're not meant to do that. I said, look, if I can see him with a child that wags a finger and shakes her head and, and says, no, you can take me then. <laughs> and I watch him now with little Evie, and she shakes that old finger, and she shakes that head, and she stamps her foot and says, no. And I think any, <laughs> any day now, swing low, sweet chariot. And as I'm going up, I'll be saying, sweet revenge. <laughs> Read my books. <laughs> my kids have for their kids something called the thinking step. It used to be called the naughty step, but that's not politically correct now. It's the thinking step. And apparently, you get a minute on the thinking step if you're naughty for every year of your life. To be honest, I can't work out what the big deal is. For me, all those minutes on the thinking step would be like a spiritual retreat. 
Evie lives her life on the thinking step. Evie has her meals on the thinking step. At night, they tuck Evie into bed on the thinking step. <laughs> but look at you now, 23 years old. Come and give Pops a kiss. Take a seat. Oh, Evie, you have brought me so much joy. You've driven your father crazy. And I'm grateful to you for that. <laughs> Darling, so often, you know, the big mistake we make with a testing child is we're so busy looking at all the negative stuff, we miss all the brilliant stuff. And you have brought such joy into our lives. You have an irrepressible laughter. You can walk into a room and light it up. I, I remember when you were little, when you were only about six years old, you got my ukulele and you're in the hall and you sing to me, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And darling, you are my sunshine. Evie, I want to talk to you about C's in the day. And for that, I have to take you to my favorite film, it's called Dead Poet Society, and it's with uh, uh, Robin Williams. And in the film, he takes a group of, of school children from the class, all boys, down the corridor, and he stands them in front of a glass cabinet with previous photographs of, of all the old pupils, all gone now, dead in the wars. And these young men look out from behind sepia photographs, smiling on the world and in a future they never had. And he said, boys, listen in. Lean towards the glass. Can you hear what they're saying to you? And they lean in. No, sir, we can't hear anything. Lean in closer. Can you hear what they're saying to you now? No, sir, we can't hear anything. And suddenly Williams is behind them and he's saying, Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Evie, a friend of mine is professor of psychology at Oxford. He was helping with one of my books a little while ago and over Curry, he said a fascinating thing to me. He said, Rob, most people believe a future event will make them happy. If I could win the lottery, if we could move house, if I could pass that exam, sometimes something pretty small. When I go out with my mates on Saturday night, I'll be happy. He said, Rob, really happy people grasp it now. Because now is all we've got. You and I in this auditorium this evening, we will never do this in the same way again. This is our now. But you know, sometimes, Evie, it's hard to, to seize the day, and for several reasons. Number one, sometimes it's hard to seize the day because of the past, and for two opposite reasons. Number one, because the past is so good, we think it'd never be repeated. Oh, do you remember the old days? The trains ran on time, and the Christmases were snowier, and people were nicer to each other. Remember those old days? I was talking to your brother not long ago. And I told him about a quirky book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. I want to give you a line from that old book as well. Don't say why were the old days better than this. It is not wise to ask such questions. It will rob you of today. I'm a child of the 60s. What, what I mean by that is 60s is my music. And, and, and not long ago, Diane bought me two tickets for Sound of the 60s concert in St. David's Hall in Cardiff. I was so excited. For two hours, I'm going to be breathing the same air as my childhood heroes, Freddie and the Dreamers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, the swinging blue jeans, for goodness sake. It was, it was on a Friday night, and, uh, and, and on the Tuesday night, I, I, I practically woke Diane up. I said, only three more sleeps. I was so excited. Uh, and I get into St. David's Hall, it is crowded. And I turned to Diane, and I said, why is the audience so old? She said, we're old. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, the bands were older than the audience. The leader of the swing blue jeans came on, he apologized, he couldn't jump about because he'd hurt his back. I didn't want to know about his back, I wanted him to be old, as he had been. And, and you know, Evie, the music was, uh, w was great. Uh, and as I left the concert, it was raining. I pulled the collar of my coat up, and, and a stunning realization hit me. Those teenagers weren't as great as I remembered. Teachers were nasty to me. Girlfriends finished with me. <laughs> Lots of them. <laughs> Pimples attacked my face like the barbarian hordes descending on the Romans. Those days weren't as great as I remembered. Don't say why were the old days better than this. It will rob you of today. But sometimes the problem is not the past is so good it could never be repeated. It is that the past is so bad we can never be free of it. Darling, if I could keep you from suffering, I promise you, you could take my life now. But I can't. 
But I want to take you to a man who I think suffered at least as much as you may have to, to show you how he stopped it defining his life. But for that, my darling, I have to take you to Auschwitz. I've been to Auschwitz twice. First time was when Poland was still under communist rule. It was a February morning, about 10 o'clock. A mist was coming across the fields. There was a light rain in the air. The arch was over Auschwitz as it was all those years ago. The railway tracks still go into Auschwitz. And in those days, if you were on the train and you were young and healthy and fit, you got off on the right-hand side of the train onto the platform there. And if you were very young or elderly or sick, you got off on the left-hand platform. And if you got off on the left-hand platform, you made your way down to the shower block. Except, darling, we know there weren't uh, shower blocks. And Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who worked in several of the death camps. He lost his wife, he lost his friends, but he went on reaching out uh, to people. And when finally Dachau was liberated, somebody said to him, how did you go on doing it? How, in the midst of all that, you lost almost everything? How could you go on reaching out to others? Do you know what he said? Let me, let, let me read it to you, my darling. He said this, they can take everything from you. They can take your health. They can take your loved ones. They can even take your life. But one thing they cannot take is your right to choose your attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And in this old book, The Wisdom House, many years ago, darling, and I wrote this. When the bad times come, we can be forgiven for becoming bitter, for seeking revenge, for ceasing to believe there's a God who loves us. That is understandable. But Frankl says there is another way. We can choose a different response. We can choose not to condemn ourselves to a prison of a thousand what-ifs. We can choose faith over cynicism. We can choose to affirm that although it is broken and battered, it is still a beautiful world with endless possibilities for redemption and hope. But darling, sometimes it's not the past that stops us seizing the day, but the future. I, I just had Freddie in, and I told him I used to sit on, on my lap there as I would read to him from the Velveteen Rabbit. I used to sit on my lap there, but you remember what I used to read to you? Yes, the Mr. Men books. My favorite was Mr. Worry. Mr. Worry worried about everything. He worried about his hat and his coat and his car and his cat and his roof. And, and if he had nothing to worry about, well, that really worried him because he was sure he must have missed something. And you know, darling, even now, Pops is sometimes like Mr. Worry. I wake up in the morning, it's still dark, and I start to worry. I worry about work and I worry about health and sometimes I worry about my kids and sometimes I worry about you grandkids. And most of it's a lot of nonsense. Mark Twain said, most of my tragedies have never, ever happened to me. You know, darling, those worries can define our lives. When the old map makers used to make the maps, they used to get together with the explorers, and they would say to the explorers, tell us what it looked like, and they would draw the maps. And when they got to the edge of exploration, and the explorers could help them no further, they would write on the edges of the maps, beyond this there may be dragons. Nobody had ever seen a dragon, and when the explorers got into those new lands, they were often beautiful and full of incredible natural resources, but right now it was the future, and therefore beyond this there may be dragons. Do you know what, Evie, darling, sometimes we write those words on the edges of our lives. We allow fear to define us, but we're not meant to live like that. The smartest man who ever lived said, don't worry about tomorrow, you have enough to worry about today. Give us today our daily bread. This is the day the Lord has made. What day is it, asked Pooh. Why, it's today, squeaked Piglet. Ah, said Pooh, my favorite day. <laughs> Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. And that's why we call it the present. But darling, if you are to seize the day, you are going to have to do battle with the great enemy, time. Time's a fascinating thing. You can't buy it, you can't mortgage it, you can't rent it, you can't save it. People say to me, oh, I saved an hour. Oh, really? Where did you put it? You can save money under the bed, but you can't save time. You can only spend time. 
and everybody wants more time, but unfortunately, everybody has all the time there is. Tonight, my darling, in a penthouse in Manhattan, a billionaire will die, surrounded by doctors, lawyers, accountants, consultants, and at exactly the same time, a beggar will die alone in the streets of Calcutta. Those two men only had one thing the same the whole of their lives. At one second past midnight, a big bag of minutes was delivered to the foot of each man's bed. And 24 hours later, at one second to midnight, each man's bag was empty. No amount of power, prestige, or money could buy one more second. And every choice we make with time precludes another. You have decided to be with me in the study, you darling. We can't even be in the living room. You're with me in this auditorium tonight. You're you have made a choice. Every choice precludes another. And darling, I want you to be successful in every way, but I'm urging you, give time to relationships. As you get older, you will see that time truly is the most precious asset. Brian Dyson used to be the CEO of Coca-Cola Enterprises. And Dyson said, he said, when you're young, you juggle five balls, work, family, uh, uh, friends, spirit, and health. You juggle those balls. And he said, when you're young, you juggle them as though they're all made of the same material, but they're not. Some of them are made of rubber. You drop some of them, they've got a chance of bouncing back. Perhaps the work one will bounce back, but some of them are made of glass. They don't bounce too well. You'd be wise to pay more attention to those. And often, darling, that means an investment of time. You know, when they examined the, the phone calls made on September 11 after the Twin Towers had been hit by the planes. When they asked people to try to remember what loved ones had said, often before they jumped to avoid the flames. When they reread emails hurriedly sent, when they listened to messages left from the mobile phones on the other doomed planes, the same three words came up time and time again. These people had only a little time. They just said, said to themselves, how am I going to use this time? What word shall I speak? Who shall I invest this time with when I have so little of it left? The same three words. None of those words described share prices. Or size of salary, or car driven, or second home. Could, no, no, no. Lovers said them to lovers. Husbands to wives. Wives to husbands. Friends to friends. Parents to kids. I love you. Jack, I love you. Chloe, it's dad. I know we haven't got along together recently, but if you get this message, I love you. Tell mom I love her. Because darling, when it comes down to it, nothing matters like relationships. But so often we forget that in the busyness of life. Time. Darling, did you know that using Google can be dangerous? Do you know, the other day I, I went to Google to try to discover the name of the fifth president of the United States, and a little box popped up. Would you like to know the day you're going to die? Well, who could resist it? Ah, uh, yes, I, I would. They sent me a questionnaire, 30 questions. Took me an hour to fill it in. Do I drive? Yes. Do I always wear a seatbelt? If I'm being driven, do they wear a seatbelt? Do I drink? Do I smoke? How many sexual partners have I had? Do I run? Do I walk? Took me an hour to fill this thing in. And I send it back, and then a little button says, would you like us to calculate? Hmm. I press the calculate button, and Evie, it flashes at me. It's working out how many years I've got left. And finally, there's a figure. So many years left. And so few. Darling, I'm not much of a techie. I don't like those electronic diaries. I still like those old desk diaries. I can only get them in charity shops now. Oh, look, 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 look there's one there. The, every, every little page with squares, and, and it says August the 17th in the square, and, and then another square, and I, I write things like dentist with a pen. Do you, do you remember those things? I, I like those things. And every day I'm pulled through a door from one box into another. August 17 comes along, and it says to August 16, he belongs to me now, and it pulls me through the door and into its box. And then the next date comes, and I'm pulled through the door into its box. And so I go through my life, pulled through a door from one box into another. Darling, there is for Pops a box that has no doors. No amount of money, power, prestige can change that day. It's the day I'm going to die. 
Now, darling, I don't know what you will end up believing, and I certainly don't know what the good folk in the auditorium believe, but I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the deepest philosophical question in the universe is this. Does that box have no doors? Because it's just a coffin and death is the end. Or does it have no doors because it has no walls? And it's a beginning. And that, my darling, as our time in the study comes to an end, gives me the chance to tell you, I think, my favorite story in the whole world. It's a little boy whose parents owned one of the very first telephones. They lived on the plains in America. He said it was a wooden thing, and, and it was put on the wall, and, and the man told my mother how to use it. You would wind it up, and you had to say, information, please. And a voice would say, this is information. And information, please, would get my mother uh, a number, or, or sometimes prophesy the weather, or tell her the time. And, and one day, when I was nine years old, my mom and dad were out, and I banged my thumb with a hammer. There's no point crying because there was nobody in. And then I remembered the telephone. And I got a stool and I stood on it and I wandered up and I said, information, please. And a voice said, this is information. And I said, I bang my thumb. And information, please, said, is your mummy in? No. Is your daddy in? No. Is it bleeding? No. Could you get to the ice box? Yes. Hold some ice against it. He said it worked. He said, after that, I rang information, please, for anything. Information, please, help me with my geography homework. She told me where Philadelphia is. Information, please, taught me to spell disappear. And when my pet canary died, I cried and said, why would God make anything that can sing so beautifully and let it die? Information, please, said Paul, you must always remember there are other worlds to sing in. And then my parents moved to New York City, and I was out of her area. And anyway, I didn't believe information, please, could live in this new plastic phone, and I never rang her again until I was 24 years old. And I flew into my old town, and I'm in the airport lounge, and I look at the phone and think, well, I wonder. And I dial, and I say, information, please. And a voice says, this is information. And I said, could you teach me to spell disappear? And she said, I expect that thumb is better by now. And I said, have you any idea what you meant to me? She said, have you any idea what you meant to me? We couldn't have children of our own. I used to love it when you rang. Now, I'm very old now. I only come in a couple of hours a week. But you remember my name, Sally. If you're in my area, you please ask for me so we can talk. And I promised I would. And if I was in an area, I would often catch her and and one day I rang and I said, information, please. And a different voice said, this is information. And I said, oh, I wonder if I could speak to Sally. And, and the lady said, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, Sally died a couple of weeks ago. She was very old. She only came in occasion. Oh, I'm sorry to trouble you. No, no, wait. Uh, is your name Paul? Why, 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 yes, it is. Well, Paul, Sally said, if you happen to ring, we must be sure to give you this message. Paul, you must always remember there are other worlds uh, to sing in. And darling, I want you to be successful in every way you can, but I want you to walk through life with your eyes a little higher on that other world. It won't explain everything. Don't let people, even religious people, give you easy answers to pain. It won't explain everything, but it will explain much. And it will give you hope. Well, Evie, I'll see you uh, uh, later on. Now give Pops uh, another kiss. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the hard thing about writing a book is how do you finish the things. And I wasn't sure how to finish the wisdom house. And, and then I came across some words that apparently hung on the wall of Mother Teresa's office. And I asked David Suchet if he would finish our evening by reading them to us. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. 
be kind anyway. If you are successful, you'll win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. And what you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Well, be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being uh, with uh, us this evening. I honestly thought I'd be face to face with you, but I hope it's been a help to you. We, we've done the very best we can to bring the Wisdom House uh, to you in your homes or where, wherever you are listening. These are unusual times, uh, aren't they? This coronavirus has, has shaken all our uh, worlds. And I wonder if I could ask you to help us at this time in, in Care for the Family. You know, sometimes people say to me, well, why do you mention finance? And I, I find that strange. We're a charity. In 30 years, we've had almost no government help. I say to audiences, wherever we go, if you can't afford anything that we sell, drop us a line. We'll, we'll send it to you free of charge. The royalties from all my books and Catherine Hill's books go, go into a charitable trust. And, and I say to people, if I can't ask people I'm face to face with, who can I ask? So although not quite face to face, I'm asking you now in your homes or wherever you are, would you help us? And, and I've put together a little pack which I'd like to send you. Well, more than a little pack, I think, uh, as a thank you if you're able to do that. If you're able to help us with a monthly sum, it could be £5 a month or £2 a month or £10 a month, less or more, just go to the comments section on the screen and follow that link to our donor page and, and just give something. And, and if you're able to do that, I'd like to say thank you, I think in a, in a special way. We'll get this pack straight in the post to you. Uh, there's a copy of my brand new book. This is only just hot off the press. It's called The Heart of... Uh, communication. I, it's hard back, uh, and I, I'll send you a signed copy of that dated to mark the day you became a partner with Care for the Family. Even if it's not for you, it might be a nice gift for somebody. And I'd like to send you the film of tonight, The Wisdom House, so you'll be able to watch that again, and, and I hope that you'd enjoy that. And, and then perhaps also there's a, a hardback copy of, of my book, The Wisdom House, and I'll, I'll sign that as well and date it if I may. And then a lovely little book which we specially commissioned, The Little Book of Soul Care. I honestly think whatever you believe or don't believe, there's stuff in that book which would help you. I wrote on the front, I believe this little book can make a big difference in our lives. And then a copy of this. Well, this is the book that changed my life. Apart from the good book, this is the book. It was 1984, one of the lowest moments of my life, and somebody gave me a book by Lewis Smeads called How Can Everything Be All Right When Everything's All Wrong? And it did that. It, it changed my life. I'd like to send you a copy of that. So that's quite a substantial pack, but, but not just to say thank you, but also to put our resources in your hands for you to give and use with others. So if you're able to help us, no matter how small or great, and I would especially appreciate it in these testing times, just go to the link in the comments page. Give whatever you can, a little a month. and Allow me to send the pack to you to sign the books, to date them, the day you became a partner with us, and we'll see if we can do some good together. And I promise you, there'll be a child, a mum or dad, a single parent, a, a parent with children with additional needs. There'll be a grieving parent somewhere whose lives will be touched because of what you have done this evening. Thanks for being with us. Uh, that was the Wisdom House. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here this evening. And if you can still become a partner with us, we would be truly grateful. But we hope you enjoyed the evening and we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon.